ಇತಿಪಿಸೋ ಬದೇವಾ ಅರೇಹ ಸಂಬುಧೋ ವಿಧ್ಯಾಚರಣ ಸಂಪನ್ನೋ ಸುಗತೋಕವಿದು ಅನುತ್ತರು ಪುರಿಷದಮಸಾರತಿ ಸತ್ತೇವ ಮನೋಸ್ಥಾನ Namaste. So I was very surprised after yesterday's video to get several messages from different people and comments on the channel pushing back against the idea that you can't attain anything unless you practice intensely. Just one hour a day here and there is not going to do it. Now, you know, it's been my policy here from the beginning, eight, nine years ago, to always tell you the truth according to my experience. And my experience is, you don't attain anything significant. By significant, I mean like path realizations or enlightenment itself. Without an extraordinary effort. Gurdjieff called it a super effort. You know, 150%. You have to go beyond what you think your limitations are. Otherwise, you're just going round and round in the same orbit. You're not really getting anywhere. Just making progress in circles. <laughs> Why is that? It's because any significant change in consciousness is a quantum effect. What do I mean by a quantum effect? It's a step up. Uh, it's not a gradual uh, accumulation of hours of sitting. No. It's a period of intensive practice that leads to a jump, a leap to a new level. A long time ago, in another video, we talked about the seven energy levels of the seven chakras. And this is the same kind of thing, that to jump from one energy level to, an, to the next requires a specific effort. And as you get higher on the scale, the amount of effort required to jump becomes higher and higher. It's like climbing a mountain. In the beginning, you can just hike through the foothills, you know, very nicely. But once you get to the mountain itself, you're faced with sheer rock walls. And it's a whole different level of energy, whole different level of skill required specialized equipment and so on. Here's another analogy, another simile. You know, the Buddha makes the simile of the near shore and the far shore. And the teaching is like a boat that gets you from this shore to Nibbana, the far shore. But in our case, the boat is leaky. It's taking on water all the time. This human body is subject to conditioning from the surrounding environment and nature. It's not just a machine. It learns, it picks up patterns. It gets conditioned by our experience in the world. And what is that experience? <laughs> that I am the body, I am an individual, I am this owner of this body, of this karma, of all these activities and possessions and blah, 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 blah. You know the story. How do we divest ourselves of that delusion? It cannot be done with an ordinary effort. It can only be done with a super effort. And that's why I stress performance of karma yoga 
because by performance of karma yoga over a significant length of time, one accrues pious karma. And that leads to a situation in life where you do not have to expend effort to maintain your existence. It's like retirement, or a better example is sannyas, renunciation. In the midst of family life and business and children and all the stuff that comes up from family and relationships and, and work and all this, how can you find the time for that intensive uh, activity, that intensive meditation? It's impossible. I've been married. I had kids. I know how it is. It's just ridiculous. It's like just taking care of the daily duties takes up 99% of your time. And if you have five minutes to even think about meditation, you're lucky. No. From the beginning, I was taught by my gurus, beginning with my Adi guru, that self-realization is not cheap. It's not an easy thing. You have to immerse yourself in it to really get anywhere. My Adi Guru gave up his family at age 55. He took sannyas. And from that moment, he was 24-7 engaged in self-realization. Similar with my other gurus. They were all monks. They've all passed on now. But when I was with them, they were living as monks and I was living as a monk. So I got the most out of their instruction. Let me give another simile. If you know anything about physics or electronics, an electron can have several different energy states. But it doesn't just jump from one energy state to another without some exchange of energy. For example, if you point some uh, light at an atom, the electrons will jump up to higher energy states. But then if you remove the stimulation, light, electricity, radiation, heat, what have you, then the electrons gradually decay down to lower energy levels. And that's the way we are. We are a leaky boat. You have to bail as hard as you can just to keep from sinking. What to speak of making any headway. So that's the way it is in spiritual life too. We have to work very hard just to maintain whatever level of realization we've got. But to reach a higher level means we have to make a super effort. And that takes time. That time has to be a time where we feel free, where we have no obligations. I'll give you an example from just today. I've been sleeping during the afternoon when it's hot, because it's very hot here. And then I wake up in the evening, late afternoon or evening, and I stay up very late. And this morning, I took a little nap after dinner, and then I woke up at like 12.30 a.m. this morning, and I spent the whole silent part of the night until like 5 o'clock in meditation. Ah, oh, it was so wonderful. But if I was working, if I was tied to some schedule, some organization, some role, some designation, some activity huh, in the material world, I could never do that. I could never meditate in complete silence for four hours straight. It could never happen. So that's why you have to reach the stage of renunciation. 
The Buddha gave this instruction many times. I'm going to read one time here. If on examination a monk knows, I usually remain covetous with thoughts of ill will, overcome by sloth and drowsiness, restless, uncertain, angry, with soiled thoughts, with my body aroused, lazy or unconcentrated, then he should put forth extra desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness for the abandoning of those very same evil, unskillful qualities. Just as when a person whose turban or head was on fire would put forth extra desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness to put out the fire on his turban or head. In the same way, the monk should put forth extra desire, effort, diligence, endeavor, relentlessness, mindfulness, and alertness for the abandoning of those very same evil, unskillful qualities. So practice like your hair is on fire. Because it is. This world is burning, the Buddha says. There's another sutta, which I'm not going to quote, in, except indirectly. The world is burning. The body is burning. The senses are burning. The mind is burning. Everything is burning. Just like if you see an abandoned building. Huh? It's sitting there out in the sun and wind and rain. The paint is peeling off. The wood is rotting. The roof is falling in. That's this body. It's not going to last forever. And the earlier you start, the more benefit you can accrue. But you have to practice like your hair is on fire. You have to make as much time as you need, as much time as you can, available for the practice, or else you're not going to get anywhere. That's my experience. And I know I was married. I had jobs. In fact, my lifestyle was like I would go to America, get a job or a contract, more likely, with some company, do a bunch of projects, save up a bunch of money. After a couple of years, I'd quit. I'd go back to India, and I'd live in a temple, a monastery, an ashram. Or I would rent a small cabin somewhere and just stay by myself and practice, 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 practice. One time, right after I retired in 2001, I went to Hawaii, Kauai Island, if you know. And in Kauai, there are many beautiful beaches and forests and like that. So I camped on a forest near a beach. And I just practiced like 12, 14, 16 hours a day. That's all I did. Practice, eat, sleep. Practice, eat, sleep. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night and the moon would be out. And you know, Hawaii is so beautiful. And I would just practice my ass off. Because I knew every day I'm getting older. I'm getting closer to death. I have to be able to deal with this reality in the best way that I can. And I know from my experience that investing time in intensive practice is the way to attain results. Like when I got first path realization back in 1984, I was practicing 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day sometimes. So you have to be willing and able to make that kind of investment and the ability to do that comes from the results of karma and bhakti yoga. So you can't just jump into meditation 
or sit down for an hour a day, uh, it's not going to get you anywhere. You have to arrange your life in such a way that you can take extended time for intensive practice. And that is the path to enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti. Aum. Um.